there's two ways to use language. Like, let's say I'm going to pick up a girl in a bar, all right? So I have a goal in mind, and the goal is sort of the girl is irrelevant to the goal insofar as she could be another girl. So it's 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 a, it's a psychopathic goal in some ways, because really, really, because the individual doesn't matter. It, it, it is. I'm, I'm, I'm serious about that. It's a, so what I'm going to do, say if I'm a pickup artist, I follow these pickup artists online, eh, because I'm so curious about their use of psychology. And all they ever do is come up with, it's like a whole horde of men talking about how to deceive and manipulate women. It's, it's extraordinarily interesting and extremely psychopathic. And, and also, it's very, 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 very unsophisticated and unskilled. Because what the guys are, they're lumps, basically, and what they're trying to do is to acquire the veneer of sophistication. And that's psychopathic. So, anyways, that's my, my little spiel on pickup artists. But they're very interesting. So what they're doing is teaching their followers instrumental language. So if you want to sleep with a girl, here's how to do it. Here's how to manipulate her, you know. They have a bunch of tricks like wear an expensive watch and dress up. And also, don't just dress up, so dress up rich, roughly speaking. But also add something peculiar to your wardrobe. Like something that really stands out as somewhat odd. They call that peacocking. So that the girl can see that not only are you rich and successful, but you've got that little bit of individuality that sets you apart from all the other rich and successful guys, you know. And so that's like an Osiris Horus combination, basically. But it's all bullshit, because the guys aren't like that. So it's, so, so, and then they have all these little routines they use that are verbal routines, and they have these guys they go to the bar with to help them with their little routines. And it's like, it's completely, what are they doing? They're using language instrumentally. They have a goal in mind, which is their goal, and they know that what the goal is, and they know that the goal is right insofar as they're pursuing the goal, and then they're willing to say anything to obtain that goal. Now you think, well, I think that's the instrumental use of language. What do you do if you're not using instrumental language? That's interesting. What you do is you try to communicate about the situation and your response to the situation, whatever it is, as clearly and accurately and articulately as you possibly can, all the time, and see what happens. That's a whole different thing. Because the proposition there is, to the degree that you're transforming your experience into reality, into articulated reality, the things that will follow from that will be the best things that can possibly be, even if you don't know what they are. So there's an openness in, in that approach. It's like, I'm going to conduct my relationship with person X in the most truthful possible manner, and I'm going to see what happens. And then I'm also going to assume that whatever happens is the best thing that could have happened. Because, like, how the hell do you know if it's the best thing that could have happened? Maybe the person's all offended and irritated. I've seen this with my clients a lot, so especially with the agreeable ones, because eh? they're all bent out of shape with resentment because they're not saying something. You know, and so... And, you know, and because they're not saying something, they're getting shepherded into some situation they don't want to be in. Like, maybe they're, they have to go live with someone they don't want to live with, and they don't want to, you know, express themselves because that'll hurt someone's feelings. It's like, so, we talk about that in a bunch, and we figure out how you could say what you actually think. And usually what happens is, they say it, they get in a whole bunch of trouble, and then two days later the problem goes away. So, they're afraid... To say what they, they're actually using silence instrumentally, basically, because their idea is, I don't want to fight with you. Well, so how do I not fight with you? I don't say anything that will upset you. It's like, will upset you when exactly? You know, like if, you, if you're an intimate partner with someone and you see them doing something stupid repeatedly that is going to lead them into a pit in like a month or two months or a year or five years, you don't get to say, well, I'm not going to fight with you just because that'll be trouble because sooner or later they're going to fall in a pit and that's going to be trouble too. So you're not doing them any damn favors. You're just forestalling the catastrophe into the future. It's not helpful. Where instead you could say, well, here's how it looks to me and this is, you know, how it looks. It looks to me like this is where this is going and you probably don't want to go there and even if you do, I'm not going to aid and abet it. And then they're going to get all upset and they're going to tell you that you're interfering and that you're mean and that you're cruel and that you can only see the bad in things and if you withstand all that, then they're going to get really angry and stomp out and if you can withstand that, then they're going to cry. They'll go home and think about it and a week later they'll come back and say, I never want to see you again. Probably not. Or they'll say, geez, you know, I thought about that and what you said made sense, and I'm going, to do, I'm going to try to do something about it. So, but you have to decide to begin with whether or, not you, whether or not you're willing to risk the consequences of the truth. And that doesn't mean you get to use the truth as a weapon. I mean, that's not truthful. You can use the truth as a weapon. 
you know, if you see someone who's perhaps not as attractive as they could be, you could say, um, you're, you're rather ugly. You know, which in some sense is the truth. It's a, it's a statement about, but it's not the truth at all. Because for it to be the truth, it has to be embedded. What it really has to be is embedded in the Osiris Horus pyramid. You know, what the utterance has to serve the entire function of that integrated unit. It has to serve tradition, it has to serve enlightenment, it has to serve vision. And if it isn't doing any of those things, it's not the truth. Even if it's the truth in this local tiny slice, you know, I, I just told you the truth. It's like, no, you didn't. You took a little fragment of what could be interpreted to be the truth, and you turned it into a bat, and then you hit me with the bat, and then you defended yourself by a false argument that's claiming that when you use the truth in a local manner like that, you're actually moral. That's right, that's not true. It's incredibly deceptive. Because, you know, the best way to deceive someone is to sort of tell them the truth. And then you, not only, you can really get the person then, eh, because not only are you innocent because you told the truth, they're even more guilty because they're too weak to handle the truth. So man, you can really wallop someone.